Growing up with an alcoholic mother, I would have reactions to her drinking or being drunk. I would react with shame or anger or deep disappointment, deep embarrassment, sometimes even terror, especially if she was drinking and driving. And later, when I got to therapy, therapy taught me that I was having normal reactions to a very abnormal situation. It's a really great phrase to reframe our childhood trauma, that we were having normal reactions to an abnormal situation. But at the time, we weren't getting any help from healthy adults that could confirm that our reactions were right-sized or could help us through and find some meaning making or at least just sort of tell us the truth about what was going on. We didn't get that. So that's the point of this video is we were, we were gaslit about what was going on compared to what our feelings were telling us. So, and being told, I, you know, growing up I was told that I was selfish, that I was silly, that I was lame for having those reactions or bringing anything up. And if I brought up her behavior after she was drunk in front of my friends or drunk with a teacher or <laughs> drunk um, even in front of a stranger like at the grocery store, she would have an intense reaction and turn it around on me very intensely and very quickly. That how could you, you're being too hard on me, you're wrong, you know what I mean? It just like, it would reality would go from my feelings to this awful shame mess is where I would end up in, which is the whole point to this video. And later in my 20s, um, in my late teens and 20s, I waited tables for quite a while. And I was, this is kind of how my brain works about correlating these childhood stuff with present focus stuff, is if a restaurant manager came to me and said, you know, Mike's sick, you gotta take Mike's shift tonight, can you do it? Um, there'd be that pressure, because it's like, you know, the restaurants are a lot like toxic family systems where the restaurant comes first. <laughs> um, and if I couldn't take the shift or I didn't wanna take the shift, I would try to say no. But the manager's vibes, either their disappointment or their self-righteousness or whatever, is I would gaslight myself and then change my mind and then go back to the manager and say, you know what, I can make it happen. Is that's how this stuff works, is sort of the shame from our childhood affects the way that we gaslight ourselves. And it's very much true, we can gaslight ourselves in the present. Uh, in the present. And later, with intimate relationships, if conflict came up, I talk myself out of saying anything because it was clear at that point in my life to me that I was selfish and I usually got things deeply wrong. So with my mother's drinking, I lost perception and intuition. Those are words I'm gonna be using through the course of this video of having the right to the feelings of being deeply embarrassed by her alcoholism. And she would gaslight me, turning those normal reactions into selfish ones. My mother, my mother also had the tendency to just flat out deny that things happened, even though that we like <laughs> we had receipts, we had a paper trail. You know, mom, you did this yesterday. I never, we never went there. We never did that. That's not true. And it would drive you to an insane to the point that you really started to have issues with reality, which is another way to gaslight somebody. Um, with my restaurant managers, I would quickly lose the perception that my life should take precedence over the restaurant's life and or their staffing problems and I would gaslight myself. And with friends and partners later in life, I would vacillate between being upset by something and then hate myself for being so bothered by the thing and I would gaslight myself. Mm. In the first example with my mother, I was conditioned to not trust my intuition or to not use my feelings that operate like a compass for us. Gaslighting is manipulation and the fuel that is used in that manipulation is shame. That's why trauma survivors are so vulnerable to being gaslit and that's why I think we tend to gaslight ourselves. So throughout my whole childhood, I was caught in this pattern of having normal feelings and reactions and those would get turned into being shameful and wrong assumptions. So in this video, I'm gonna be getting into that pattern and we're also gonna look at potential childhood trauma factors that cause us to gaslight ourselves, as well as go over some exercises about how to avoid second guessing ourselves, which is to gaslight ourselves when these triggering situations come up. If you're so. new to me or new to the channel, welcome. If you like this video or think it's interesting, you can hit some buttons on your screen. You can't miss with any of the buttons. If you find that these videos are helpful to you and your recovery, you can consider supporting the work that goes into this channel over at my Patreon. And you can also get in touch with me through my website, which is also a good place to check out some childhood tra trauma therapy coursework that I offer there. And this October, I'm gonna be doing a webinar on shame, which is related to this video. And if you sign up for my mailing list on my website, you'll get all the information, the when, the how, the who about the shame webinar that's going to be coming up this October. 
And lastly, if you, you can also check out my Instagram or my TikTok, and I will have all the links in the description of this video. So what I've noticed in how my clients gaslight or second guess themselves is that there's a very predictable pattern that I see between their inner adult and their inner child. And there are three steps to the pattern, and it usually goes something like this. The first step is something comes up that we want to get addressed or get changed. Like we want to have a conversation with our family about that Thanksgiving thing. We want to we want to work through a bump with our partner about some kind of issue. We're trying to make a decision on something like going back to school or trying something creative or trying something new in our life. Or we try to set a work boundary like sort of saying no. So we're trying to change things or trying to get things addressed. The second step is that thing plays itself out, meaning the conversation with our family just becomes like a finger pointing rage and shame fest, like in my example with my mom, or the bump with our partner goes down the rabbit hole of confusion and it just becomes a big messy disconnection. Or we get triggered or discouraged at taking the art class or looking going back to school or something comes up where we just experience resistance there. Or the work boundary that we created has now created tension and it doesn't feel good. So step three is what I call the tipping point to gaslighting ourselves. This is the most important part here and there's usually some kind of delay between step three, like sort of what we wanted to get addressed, how it played out, then there's a delay in what I call this tipping point. Here's what I mean. In the family fight, our inner child, some time goes by and our inner child pops up and says, you know, maybe dad is right. Maybe I am too hard on mom. Maybe we're just bad in this. Or with the bump with our partner, our inner child might pop up and say, you know, they're probably gonna leave us now because we asked them to help us pay for rent. Or the inner child in trying something new, the inner child might pop up and say like, we're awful, why did we think we could do this? This is never gonna work, we suck at stuff like this. Or in the work boundary, our inner child might pop up, like in the case of that you know, uh, restaurant manager thing, like um, I should be fired for saying no, or someone else is gonna have to take that shift and people are gonna hate us. So the tipping point is actually the place where we shift out of our natural intuition and perception into our trauma due to shame that we carry from that period in our lives. The tipping point is also the opportunity place for us to do some real inner child work and figure out where we go back to in childhood and how things are actually different in the present or how we're different in the present. The tipping point is the intersection where we can reclaim like sticking to our truth about our perception and it's really a moment of opportunity, but it's really hard to do, but you can do it if it's, it just takes some practice. Do you have a similar pattern of starting in one place, of trying to get something addressed or changed, and where do you end up once things get complicated or rocky or triggering? What got you there between those two points? How did I shift from, I'm sorry, I can't take that shift tonight, to like, you know what, I can make it work. Like there is a whole inner child process in there that is gonna get resolved if we can find a stronger inner adult to catch this stuff when it comes up and then prevent it from losing our perception and losing our intuition. Um, I think it just sort of happens because we get triggered and we go right back to a place of shame where we start to second guess ourselves or we start to backpedal or whatever. So let's look at why that happens or where it comes from, from looking at some toxic family system dynamics. Children who are gaslit will gaslight themselves later in life. A simple way to look at all childhood trauma is that the abuse is, is, is around losing our natural intuition or an abuse on our perception and having that those things become lost to us. Here are some childhood trauma examples of being gaslit as children which are most likely still with us and run this stuff when it comes to shame. So an example is having a childhood where you're made to feel like you're a burden rather than a child deserving of care and space. That child will perceive the world as like barely tolerating them and make them vulnerable to gaslighting. So in friendships or jobs or relationships, they will gaslight themselves back to an indebted vibe rather than an empowered vibe when these things come up. Another example, kids whose parents model that loyalty to work comes before loyalty to family. They might second, they might second guess themselves around leaving jobs or advocating for themselves. Um, they will gaslight themselves around 
their worth being wrapped up in achieving or doing or, or showing up. Another example is children who are gaslit around not being good at something versus having like a learning process. They may gaslight themselves about not having the right to try things or not having the right to be good at things. Like for example, being told you're not good at piano by an abusive parent just after a month of lessons is being gaslit that there's no such thing as being a beginner, which isn't true at all. That's what I mean by that one. Another example is children who are told they are too sensitive. This is like the classic gaslighting example. They might grow up into adults who second guess themselves about being too much. And they may also gaslight themselves around their reactions, just like I did growing up. Another example is children who are parentified might later gaslight themselves around it being their job to do everything. Like they're bad if they don't bring donuts to work every day. It's their job if no one else is going to do it. So it's, you know, we'll talk ourselves into those things. Another example is children who grow up uh, with abuse around reality. You know, parents that say like, that never happened, or we're a great family, or um, you know your mother loves you, you know that. Or we moved here because you said you had no friends, where the reality of existence or the 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 functionings of the family are kind of wrapped up in this scapegoated sort of meaning making. An alarming thought is that in our own infancy, our biology is wired to seek out safety from our caregivers. And to have that caregiver be abusive is to betray a child's natural intuition and wiring. So I'm saying it starts early. We have to bond with people assuming that they're safe when actually they're not. For many of us, it starts with fighting our own intuition all the way through our development. So let's get into how to work on not gaslighting ourselves and develop a practice related to that tipping point example, that third step. As many of you know by now, as I work from an inner child and an inner, inner adult framework. And if those terms don't resonate with you, you can flip it to something like working with your trauma brain or work with your shadow self. I could do a whole other video about like not liking the concept of the inner child. So here are some journeys prompts and tools when you find yourself in that tendency to gaslight yourself. The first tool is come up with three examples as best as you can about how your own perception got betrayed by being gaslit as a kid. So here's an example from my history. Around like the sixth or seventh or eighth grade or something like that, I fell into a group of kids that weren't really good for me, kids in the neighborhood. And they were like, they're not really respectful. They probably only wanted to hang out with me because I had a, you know, like a Nintendo or whatever. Or like I had this basement room that we can kind of hang out with. Like kind of like, you probably have stuff like that in your childhood too. And one of them stole a Walkman from me that I had just gotten for my birthday. It was like a fancy black Panasonic Walkman that I loved. And it had this function called auto reverse on it. Um, and I'm so old, I probably got, we got it, we got it at a store called Leechmare. That's how old I am. And that I also like listen to Walkmans. And when I went to my mother to sort of talk about it or get some help around it or whatever, she said maybe stuff like maybe he needed it more than you did. Do you ever think about that? Or maybe he'll bring it back or how can you know it was him or like all that stuff that was just like um, not helpful and just made me feel awful about myself. And that's an example of sort of being gaslit. And incidentally, Eric, if you're out there, you owe me a fancy black Panasonic uh, Walkman with auto reverse and I'll be waiting in my DMs for, <laughs> for your message on it. So that's what I mean about sort of three concrete examples where you went, try to get something resolved and it just turned, got turned around on you. So that's the first one. The second one is come up with a list of situations that you tend to gaslight yourself in the present, like going after something you want and then talking yourself out of it. Give some concrete examples of that. When you're getting close to finishing something, you might sabotage it. That might be sort of in one of your examples of where you gaslight yourself. Um, when you're in conflict and you feel awful for going there or that there is resistant, that might be an example for you. Or if you set boundaries and then give in, that might be an example for you. I kind of call this stuff like the kryptonite, like where we become really vulnerable. These examples where we have a tendency to gaslight ourselves in, or even getting paralyzed and indecision. And as you're watching this video, is there a situation right now that your inner child has sort of talked you into or talked you out of? Did you not say no to something? Are you sitting on something that you need to bring up with a friend or a partner, but you just tend not to? Um, 
Do you want to do something like go back to school or better your life in some way, but your inner child pops up and you gaslight yourself out of it? Try and think about relate these tendencies to issues growing up, like the conflict example, like were you shamed like me for bringing stuff up? So the first exercise of coming up with those concrete things is I'm trying to get people to connect the dots between their trauma and why we behave the way we do in the present. What's the truth about something that you're actually sitting on? Um, it might be the opposite of what your inner child thinks about the issue. So that's the second one. The third one is connect with your inner child and ask any of the following questions. What would happen? These are reflective questions related to how we gaslight ourselves. What would happen if you said no or disagreed growing up? What would happen if you needed help from your parents about how to feel or think about something like my Walkman scenario? What would happen if you brought up or wanted to bring up something that didn't feel right to you or wasn't right for you? What would happen when you go after something you wanted growing up, like trying out for like some kind of like after school thing? Um, what would happen with that? Once you get a sense about what the fears are, here are some helpful new beliefs to, and ideas that your healthy adult can start to reparent your inner child with. Like some, these are almost like affirmations and incidentally affirmations don't work without the concept of childhood trauma or how they, these things got lost. So here's something you can present to your inner child. We, we now, now have the right to a process, not immediate perfection. We have the right to how we see things too. That wasn't true growing up. We have the right to our truth about the issue. That wasn't true growing up. Nature gave us a working intuition and we are now honoring it. That wasn't possible growing up. We can tolerate being misunderstood. We couldn't growing up because that wasn't safe. We can tolerate disagreements because we couldn't growing up because that also wasn't safe. So some last thoughts and pointers. This is a tricky problem that requires a process and the process can be uncomfortable. It's usually uncomfortable to be right that we're in a bad work environment or we're in a bad relationship or in a bump. It's uncomfortable because we might need to make a big decision instead of buying into the old tale that we're the problem. It's also uncomfortable to recognize our tendency to gaslight ourselves as both rooted in our trauma and that it gets us into situations that aren't good for us. Like even if it's having that moody friend that we always default to or submit to, our childhoods have set us up for all that. But the flip side of, of overcoming this gaslighting thing or working on it is pretty amazing. The greatest feeling that I get from my recovery is the ability to know um, how to be a good judge of character. I never had that before and I love it. I can usually immediately know if someone or something isn't for me and that definitely wasn't always true because I used to just be such a magnet for dysfunction before I did my work. Might be related to those kids in the seventh grade. Also, having a working onboard intuition is a profound human experience. And I couldn't get it online or get it working until I unpacked how I lost it from growing up. So lastly is, you know, I I'll always think about my mentor is that when I would come in with these confusing situations, like with the, the restaurant manager or whatever, is she would be such a helpful person to kind of, she would just kind of ask me, she's like, well, but what do you really think? And it was just really the first time that I really got some parenting around like, someone sort of saying, you kind of know the answer. And imagine if we got that, you know what I mean? Imagine if sort of like you go to your mom about friends being mean to you and they kind of say like, you know, you're right. Or to get that kind of confirmation. So it's also helpful to have healthy people around us. Um, we can't do all of this alone, that when you're struggling with gaslighting yourself or second guessing yourself, 
it's really powerful to have a safe friend that you can bounce things off of. So, so I hope this video was helpful and the topic of this video is really fueled by shame. Self-doubt and shame are essentially the same thing. If you're interested in working on it, check out my webinar that I mentioned this coming October on shame this fall. And if you go to my website, you can sign up for the mailing list at the bottom of the contact page and you'll get all the info and the date and the time and all that jazz about the webinar. So as always, everyone, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well, may you be peaceful and at ease and may you be joyous. Take care and I will see you next time.